that she sees um, this kind of very formative exhibition. This is in 1910. Uh, so it's called Manet and the Post-Impressionists at the Grafton Galleries. And this is her response. I wanted to quote her. Yeah. Um, she writes in response to having seen this exhibition. Here was a sudden pointing to a possible path, a sudden liberation and encouragement to feel for oneself, which were absolutely overwhelming. It was as if at last one might say things one had always felt instead of trying to say things that other people told one to feel. Exactly. So she was she came from this very this upper middle class family. Her father was Leslie Stephen, who was a great kind of man of letters. So her world was a literary world. And then uh, her mother died when she was 16 and her older sister died as well shortly afterwards. So she ended up becoming the sort of the the main woman of the house and ended up sort of taking on that all the responsibilities that entailed at that time. So painting was a world where she could choose she could be in control this was her world this was her expertise it wasn't anything to do with writing it wasn't anything to do with mothering um and this picture i think is the most powerful expression of that um and it has this sort of melancholy sense to it as well um which i trace through the chapter I trace it back um to uh a sense of bereavement actually of of, of missing her mother uh, she she's got two children at this time that's Julian one of them and I think probably one is playing down there um and I think uh being on the beach um in that moment uh it sort of connected her very closely to her past um and to memories of being on the beach with her own mother as a child um their house in St Ives where they used to holiday was very connected to that family time and after the mother's death they never returned to the house and it really profoundly affected Virginia Woolf she her mother died when yeah she was 13 when her mother died and the sea is in almost every single one of her novels and Vanessa Bell it's less even though she lived in Sussex not far from the sea like she really never returned to the subject after this um, and also this is the most melancholy I would say of her works so there's an interesting connection there that I tried to draw out during that chapter yeah and I also think it sets up really nicely um, the next painting um, which I'm going to go to here in the sense of it, it captures this moment pre-World War One, and here we're in post-World War One, which is you know for many artists and for everyone kind of living at the time a huge paradigm shift um, can you talk about Paul Nash and how here too there's a sense of kind of bereavement or embrace of a new artistic landscape? Yeah, so I think maybe it comes back to that that idea as well that the sea is one of the few places we can go to where really what we're looking at has has never really changed ever, <laughs> um, unless you happen to see an oil tanker or wind farm out on the horizon. But um, really, I think that's quite an extraordinary thing about it, that the boundaries between the past and present are very, very thin when you look out to the sea. And in this painting, um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it really seems to me to be a, a, um, a painting shadowed by his experiences in the trenches. Uh, he was a war artist and um, saw the Battle of Passchendaele and various other um, horrific battles and was really blindsided by what he saw. He hadn't really left England before he went to war. Um, and when he got back from the war in 1918, he painted, he painted, he made sketches on the front line and then made them up, worked them up into war paintings. This was made in 1925, so actually quite a long time after his time in, um, uh, in, in the trenches, but still carries a sort of after image of everything he'd seen um so yes again i suppose it's an illustration of how memories perhaps come to the fore more uh sh more strongly at, at the seaside for some people and he also described himself he he thought about himself as a war artist in, in very conscious terms i mean he described himself as a messenger bringing back yeah his experiences in the front line yeah and then when he came back he said he was a war artist without a war um, and between 1919 and 1925, he went to live on the coast in Kent at a place called Dimchurch, where this painting is made. And um, 
he returned to the sea as a subject again and again and again and he painted it in oils he painted it he, um in watercolor he sketched it he made um he made a kind of theater scene of it he made etchings everything came back to the sea and in particular to this um very striking sea wall which you can just about see cutting across the bottom here it's this huge concrete barrier which looks like it could have been built sort of 10 years ago but uh was there at the time he stayed there in the early 20s and uh yeah many art historians have read into it as sort of it being a kind of you know the, the land being bombarded by the sea and um the wave the cruelty of the waves against this barrier and all these sorts of things um but actually if you look at it what it is is just uh, is just the sea straight on um but because of all the associations i think we carry when we think about um when we think about the war uh we also read into it um an idea of no man's land it's something about the colors something about the parallel lines the relentlessness of the approach of the waves um that kind of sallow green that's um, evocative of Wilfred Owen's poem that we all learn at school um, about the, the the green of the of the gap the gas um, yeah so this is a sort of yeah a darker version of the sea I suppose can you all hear me with this mic yeah you're right I I just wanted to um, flag what you said because it's going to come up later but what's also um, striking about the book is how with our relationship to the to the paintings itself and you talk about this relationship that um it's important kind of our associations to what we bring to the paintings and this um you mentioned Dimchurch this allows me to bring up the point too that um you insert yourself into this narrative and you're often traveling to some of these places and meeting some of these artists and engaging kind of actively why did you make that that was, yeah that was important because it's a book about ultimately it's a book about um it, I, I would say it's not really about the sea the book it's about looking and it's about seeing and it felt very hypocritical to try and imagine how artists look and see without examining what I'm seeing so there are the layers there's there's me looking at the picture there's me trying to imagine artists looking at the landscape and translating it into an artwork and then there's me thinking about you as a reader and how you might be interpreting the image as well. So I sort of found that I had to be in it, even though it's not anyway a memoir or anything, but I had to be there just as a pair of eyes and almost as a guide to sort of hold your hand and be like, what are we looking at here? Um, so in some cases where place was particularly important, where a sense of place was particularly important, like Dim Church, which was really, it was really pivotal that I went there actually, because it helped me understand the painting in a new way I went to those places um but in some of the artworks as we'll see later on it, it sort of wasn't so relevant my experience of that place was not so relevant so I didn't go and also it was lockdown <laughs> and I had a baby so <laughs> um but yeah for the <laughs> the most of the places I have seen and most of the pictures where I can I've seen them in the flesh it's such a lovely um, through line because you kind of fade in and out. And just when we're, as you, I love this idea of kind of holding of hands because just when we feel like possibly the grip is going, you come back and you're the kind of guide. Thank you. Yes, uh, it was just a sort of, well, it can be quite alienating, I think, some art writing. I think it can be rather static. And I think what you want is someone to say, hang on, what are we looking at? And perhaps why? um so and those bits were fun for me to write as well okay on to the next piece so this is or well, please tell us um yep this is by a artist called alfred wallace who um gives an entirely different perspective on the sea because he made his living off it and lived a street away from it for his entire life barely left st ives where this painting was painted um, he started painting when he was 70, when he collected his old age pension for the first time and was sort of casting around for something to do. His wife had died and didn't have any kids, so he um, he was a bit bored, I think, basically. Uh, took up painting and made these incredibly beautiful, um, many, many paintings of boats and ships and lighthouses and cottages and his, basically his daily life. And um, the reason we know about him 
is because uh, two more famous artists, Ben Nicholson and Christopher Wood, happened to be walking past his cottage one day after a day painting on Portmore Beach, um, which is in St. Ives, and saw a glimpse of these works and thought, hey, hang on, these are these are really good. And then they had a they introduced his work into right into the center of sort of avant-garde um, circles in the 20s and 30s. Um, and a lot of his works ended up on the walls of Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, um, which is a wonderful place. If you've not been, you should go. Um, there's about 120 of Alfred Wallace's works there. So it's the largest collection in the world. And they're all painted on, this is unusually painted on canvas, but they're mainly painted on grocer's crates and bits of cardboard and um, pots and bellows and whatever he could lay his hands on. Uh, and he would often use paint that was made for boats. Yeah. Yeah. Basically he, saying this is the real paint. Yeah. It's like, why would I use that? Like, this is real paint. Yeah. So he, used, he literally went and bought like yacht, yacht paint and painted, painted uh, using that. So um, he's a wonderful character and he wrote these wonderful letters uh, to Jim Ede, who was the founder of Kettle's Yard, who collected a lot of his works. And, um, they're just, they're sort of written the way he would have spoken, and they're wonderful. And also, so you mentioned um, his kind of lack of training. Can you talk about how this interest in his lack of training um, kind of inscribes in ongoing conversations and conversations at the time about primitive art and this idea of kind of the essence of spirit? <laughs> yeah, so he would be called an outsider artist I suppose today at the time he was thought of as a primitive or naive artist um, and what's interesting is that Nicholson and Wood's work is is clearly is quite ends up quite similar to this kind of work at this time but they had been painting in a in this sort of naive style before they met Wallace so actually he sort of matched their ideal of a naive outsider artist. Basically, it's just somebody that who hasn't had any sort of formal education in art history or painting. And there is, it's slightly problematic because they're deemed to have um, a closer relationship with nature. So there's less thinking that goes into the act of making art. Um, so the story is quite complicated, but towards the end of his life, uh, Wallace was slightly neglected by the people that had bought his work. Um, even though his work was appearing in prestigious art journals, it was uh, owned by um, MoMA in New York. You know, it was exhibited on Cork Street regularly, but he ended up dying in a workhouse. So, which was his one fear. He said, I don't, I, he, he had two fears. He didn't want to end up in a workhouse and he didn't want a pauper's burial. He ended up living in a workhouse and he just avoided a pauper's burial. Um, so I sort of take that to task a bit in the book. Um, but they really respected him as an artist um, and were very concerned that his work would change, I think, if they altered his material circumstances. So, yeah. Um, he, yeah. Yeah. But he uh, he's he was also a sort of rather stubborn uh, old man, and I don't think he would have wanted to have moved particularly from where he lived. And he didn't really understand why they were paying him anyway for these works. So it's complicated. Yeah, stubborn and also very devout. So he painted every day and not Sunday. And on Sundays he would cover his paintings with newspapers and read and read the Bible. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so from. Um, biblical England to the streets of New York. You mentioned New York. We're going to jump um, yep. three decades. One, so because we're skipping over some artists to kind of tease the book um, because you'll want to know what happens in those 30 years. Um, and two, so we can get to Bridget Riley, who finds herself in the streets of New York, a superstar. Yeah. Can you talk about her, her skyrocket skyrocketing to fame? Exactly. So um, Bridget Riley um, was a painted these monochrome uh, paintings almost exclusively for the first part of her career in the early 60s. And 
they essentially captured the zeitgeist and she became a sort of poster girl for op art, um, closely related to pop art. Um, and she arrived in New York for a massive show of op art, uh, I think in the, maybe, 19, I think it was 1962. Uh, yeah, this painting wasn't exhibited there, but the work was very much like this. Um, and discovered that in all the shop windows and on the street, people were wearing uh, black and white um, sort of optical illusion style clothes. And she was, and even at the opening, people were wearing sort of essentially sort of what she, she said, her. She, the people were covered in me, she said. So um, she, what had happened is uh, a fashion designer had, uh, had had bought one of her paintings and and it had inspired some of his designs and it had then gone on to be popularized um, on the high street. Anyway, she was furious about this. Uh, she said her work had been vulgarized by the rag trade. And um, because essentially people sort of misunderstood the point of the work, which is actually um, more to do with nature and the idea of wonder and the idea of perception um than you would uh, than 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 uh, being used as a pattern you're having a big manifestation clothes. today right now um so she sort of in paris uh-huh from 262 um, to 64 and, and the people who are, have attended this had to walk to this formative experience as a child, living in a cottage um, in Cornwall again, um, it all comes back to Cornwall, Very few people um, where she just had these experiences of of the sea and swimming in the sea that are sort of seared on her imagination, and that every time she makes a painting, and she's still alive today making paintings, it, it almost it, she sort of sets out to recapture that sense of seeing something beautiful and wonderful for the first time. Um, so in this chapter, I actually end up connecting it to the wider um, budding environmental movement and particularly the work of Rachel Carson who um, is also kind of her guiding philosophy is also wonder so uh, I they're not related in any like formal sense I don't think they met or spoke or anything but it's just picked up on something of the time people wanted to reconnect with nature in that particular way um, yeah, so you wouldn't think that this was a sea picture, but really, I think at its heart, it is. <laughs> and this is a, another example of you went to see these in person because they really kind of have to be seen in person. And you had that experience. Yeah, well, there was a retrospective on of, of her work at the time I was writing. And also I worked for some time for an art collector and he had these paintings he had a very very good collection of Bridget Riley so I actually knew them quite well um and I met her once or twice so um yeah you have to stand in front of them to experience them because they I describe them as putting your eyes to work they like they sort of perform for you um because they yeah just because the, the lines move and they're even though they're black and white they colors come before your eyes like looking at an oil slick um so they are worth seeing in in the flesh if you possibly can she's such a fascinating example lily because her fame it, it, it's the story you know she as you say she's trying to do this this different kind of thing theoretical about wonder and then she gets picked up by the new york art scene and it tells a different story which is you know, there are so many different stories i think running through the book and one is the story of just art as it develops in the 20th century and so you write that at this time when she becomes kind of so famous the boundaries between high and low culture are dissolving art was becoming fashionable fashion was becoming art art was very big business commercial galleries and auction houses were flourishing dealers and artists were celebrities and that's what's kind of absorbed by her. And it, as you say, she she becomes the zeitgeist of the time unwittingly. Yeah, exactly. It's a, a fascinating moment, I think, for art because it suddenly, art becomes cool um, and it becomes accessible and um, artists become celebrities sort of for the first time in, in Britain, really. I suppose over here there would have been Picasso. <laughs> um, but in a kind of cool, 
young way and with uh, like teenagers would have known who Bridget Riley is. She shared the pages of fashion magazines with all the top models and um, yeah. Well, also, and it's it's striking too that this interest in in wonder and wonderment cuts against the kind of visual bombardment at the time. And I wanted to read a quote. So you're describing the, these experiences that she had. She says of of vision and her work. I wanted to bring about some fresh way of seeing again, and what had already almost certainly been experienced, that thrill of pleasure which sight reveals. Yeah, that's it. That pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Yeah, but she writes very beautifully um, and seriously about art. Um, and yeah, she's worth reading. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned um, the environmental movement. Our next artist is very much thinking about this. Um, and pe people have tried to pin down his work as conceptual art, land art, minimalism, performance, photography, sculpture. He feels uncomfortable with all of these labels and would simply prefer to be known as a walking artist can you tell us about Hamish Fulton yeah this um this is one of his first most important pieces he um is a walking artist so he literally his work uh, is walks without a walk there's no work there's no work without walks so um he was um very interested in uh Native American culture and uh, traveled there in his youth after going to uh, St. Martin's um, uh, College of Art. And he became uh, very aware of how sculpture and art can sometimes take from environments and take from the landscapes. And so what he does is he concentrates the art on the event of the walk itself and he will not necessarily take things from, he won't take kind of uh, souvenirs from that time or photos even. He just kind of carries the memory back and, and um, puts it into um, a few words. And that's how the work is displayed. Um, but this was a walk he did um, in 1973, I have to check the early 70s, um, from the very tip of the British Isles to Land's End, it's very tow. And at the end of that walk, he decided that he would only make works that were walks. So it was this great creative moment for him. But what I was interested in in this piece was the way that the sea um, created the work for him because he walked between its boundaries. He walked from the North Sea to the Atlantic Ocean until he could go no further. So it sort of was this marrying of an idea in his mind, an action of his body, um, and then the narrative that he placed upon it and that remains in these words. And it has echoes of a pilgrimage, but it does not have any religious connotation. So it's not quite a pilgrimage, but in terms of you, in terms of that marriage of um, mind and body, I think it does have quite interesting connections. Um, yeah, and you also you interviewed him. Yeah, I spoke to him on the phone, um, and it was either the day or the week that we actually exited the EU. So that was on both our minds. And this year, 1973, I think was the year that we Britain had entered the ECC. So um, he he was talking a lot about the British Isles. He didn't refer to it as as um, Britain um, and he was very aware that we live on an island and all that that means um, and that has really been present in his work from the beginning. Yeah, And that's something that you wanted to really draw out you know that it's, it was kind of possibly kind of forgotten in the decades to come but then as you say Brexit firmly reminded everyone who was in Britain or not that it really is an island and that it's totally surrounded by sea and so much of what these British artists are grappling with is this sense of, so I suppose, being surrounded by water. Yeah, well, it kind of struck me that here we were, I, I mean, I lived in, in London at the time and um, we think of the sea as very much a kind of peripheral thing, literally and, and, and met metaphorically as well, uh, that really exists on the edge of our lives. And in fact, Brexit really showed that it was 
very much at the center. And it was a way that um, I just was thinking about how, so it's a very simple idea, but I was thinking about how we see the same site so differently. You see the sea as a border, you see it as a connector um, and art sort of reflects those differences of, of vision. I think too, and you make this point towards the end of the chapter, that there's this sense of kind of how when he's walking, and maybe this point that he's made too, that when he's walking, he be kind of comes uh, in step with nature, that it kind of infuses his body. So you write step by step, he would set out to show how walking ties the mind to the body and the body to the surface of the earth. This is quite poetic. The dark side of that um, is that we're now facing a century in which most, if not all, parts of nature, whether they're kind of touched by microscopic particles of plastic or much in a much more disruptive sense, that man is, uh, humankind is kind of infused every part of nature. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a, uh, Bill McKibben wrote a wonderful essay in his, in one of the catalogues to his work, um, saying that essentially we used to be, there used to be sort of islands of humanity within a wider wildness and now we are literally everywhere a coke can is found at the bottom of the deepest ocean trench um uh yeah so human uh, presence in in the years since this work has been uh, made yeah. we have humankind has infiltrated almost every single <laughs> everywhere so i think that again has his work has become a lot more political and environmental over time as well. Yeah, Lily, you write um, within Fulton's lifetime, the line between the human species and everything else has started to blur. The sea no longer marks a true limit. We are found everywhere. And of course, the question that follows is what happens to us? What happens to nature when there is no limit? When you look out um, at the sea and it no longer is a kind of boundary. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, well, you can I, you see it in two ways, can't you? You can see the sea as a boundary, or you can see it as a as a connect. Or water as a massive connection between us all. Um, so, yeah, it's a question of perspective. <laughs> um, okay, this is a jarring jump, but we'll go. <laughs> so this is Martin Parr's photograph, the last resort. Yeah, so I think you, it's very hard to write about Britain without writing about class. And uh, Martin, Parr, uh, Martin Parr, a photographer, is incredibly good at sort of pinioning uh, British um, attitudes to class. Um, and uh, this is from a series called The Last Resort that he made during the early Thatcher years. Um, and it's taken at a seaside resort uh, just um, near Liverpool in the north of England. And um, they're a great, it's a great energetic series of photographs. There's about 40 pictures that he took that ended up in the final series. Um, and it attracted quite a lot of controversy when they were first shown at the Serpentine Gallery in central London. Um, people criticized him for being a sort of middle class voyeur um, and that he was showing pictures of working class degradation and that everyone is essentially having a very miserable time and it was patronizing but Pa always pointed out that he when he showed the series of works in Liverpool no one battered an eyelid it was because it was it was like that he said so um what these pictures reveal in fact was the critics um own sort of prejudices I suppose um, and also the very politically charged atmosphere of the time um, but Pa has always gone to the beach throughout his his career and he still goes yeah. there to sort of test out new cameras and things because he says that it's the place where you can see the great variety of human life um, most clearly because wherever you are in the world there's there might be a beach and you can see different cultural attitudes to how you spend your time there and attitude to leisure and um it sort of started with this series the last resort um and you can find them all online and they're they're really they're they're wonderful they're very energetic and funny and um kind of touching actually because everyone's i think everyone's having quite a good time <laughs> in them. um but yeah critics at the time really he got he got very lambasted for them 
And also, I mean, here again, the form is important. So with the walk, you know, <laughs> of this no walk, no work, um, he's chosen photography consciously. He's he's not doing it in black and white as would have normally been the case. It's 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 colorful. It's almost abrasive. It reflects the advertising industry. You say so. Can you talk also about this this decision? Yeah. So that was this was a kind of a change in his work as well, and it sort of started a whole new school of photography um, where he basically photographed um, ordinary people in with the same kind of um, high gloss, high color saturation of um, glossy magazines and advertising. So he was sort of presenting these sort of rather everyday scenes in this kind of new format. So I think that's part of why they're so compelling um, to look at. Um, but this was again why he he was criticized because he ended up making quite a lot of money as a Magnum photographer. Um, he himself was came from a very middle class background. Um, so there was a sense that he was an outsider coming to these places and taking pictures of people and sort of essentially kind of taking the piss out of them. But actually, I think there's an argument to say that he wasn't doing that at all. He was sort of elevating them. Um, so, um, yeah, but they, that, I think that, that, that thing of using very high color saturation and, and bright flash and that kind of uh, sort of, um, he positions them askew. There's quite often strange things in the foreground, um, like uh, quite often foreground a bin or a lamppost or something like that. Um, sort of generates a good energy to them that was quite novel at the time. And I also started this conversation about, you mean, you mentioned Thatcher, it's it's that time, neoliberal market-led policies, which for the people in the South, they're benefiting from this approach. And in the North, by contrast, and his photographs reflect this, it's not the case. And so it starts also a conversation about politics. Exactly. And that was partly why he got criticised, because he was one of the people that was very much benefiting from Thatcherism. Yeah. I wanted to um, read the paragraph that you wrote about this. You write, it captured something visible but unspoken about society at that time and pined it for scrutiny. It wasn't simply a portrait of a seaside resort or a community at leisure, nor was it only a snapshot of a country at a time of political and social upheaval. It was all of those things, as well as a reflection of the viewer. So again, I think an example of how you take one piece of art and fold in so many different discussions. Um, this piece of art, which isn't actually frozen <laughs> in the original. Um, can you tell us about this? So this is a still from a film called Vertigo Sea by um, an artist called John O'Confra. And this is the book finishes on on this work, it's a video piece. So part the, another sort of reason I chose the works were was because I wanted to look at all the different, well, not all of them, but many different mediums that have been used by artists over the 20th century, 21st century. And it felt very important to have a video art um, representation in it. Anyway, this is a still from a, a triptych film. So it's shown um, with two screens adjacent to it. Um, it's a 48 minute film um, and it's called Vertigo C and um, um, I, saw, I it saw it at the Venice Biennale in 2015 and it was in my memory it was absolutely enormous it, the, the screen stretched from the floor to the ceiling and I don't think that's correct but <laughs> it, it shows it's, it's a sort of indication of the kind of impact it has um, it essentially um, takes, I mean, it's a kind of, it's a work of bricolage. So it takes um, s scenes of, um, that, that he shot himself in stage like this in the Faroe Islands um, and sort of splices it with, or juxtaposes it with um, uh, footage from the BBC Nature Unit. So from Blue Planet and, and then historical footage and photographs and portraits and doesn't really give much explanation. It's just a sort of bombardment of images with an amazing uh, soundtrack of a mixture of poetry and music um, and the occasional intertitle. So it's a very kind of, it's a very immersive um, experience. 
And um, you can find, we were talking about this just before, you can find tiny clips on the internet, but it's not really representative of, of what it's like to actually watch it. Um, but yes, it's this sort of, it shows a very, uh, a very the, a very dark sublime side to the sea um and so it takes yeah it's, it couldn't be more of a contrast really to the par work and tell us about his biography because this is important in his relationship yeah so Confra um moved to Britain with his family from Ghana um when he was very young um and has spoken and, and lived in West London and has spoken of how he felt he'd, he'd make the walk from his home in, in West London to the Tate Britain in central London, but he felt quite uncomfortable in galleries because he felt that um, to, to be looking was for a, for a black man was a, was a dangerous thing that he would be judged for doing it. So he ended up taking refuge in cinema and film because he felt he could sort of look freely without being overlooked. Um, and he's spoken interestingly of a, of feeling like he had a doppelganger of um, somebody who looked like him and sounded like him, that he was aware that when people spoke to him, they were thinking of this doppelganger that wasn't quite him. And so um, film has always been a way of him to explore that idea of what it is to um, to look and also who gets to tell the stories what images carry with them, how they're saturated with meaning um, that might not be obvious at the beginning. So this work is um, a set of, he describes it as a, as, a, as a conversation between images where there's sort of no judgment passed on what you're seeing and he doesn't really explain it, but your mind is sort of left to make those associations yourself. Um, but it's worth seeing if you, do get a chance it's quite often on at galleries um, so can you talk about this word in the subtitle so it's oblique tales on the aquatic sublime and you talk about sublimity in this final section and its relationship to seeing and being seen yeah so it's hard to talk to, about the sea without the sublime the sublime to, to sum it up very briefly is a 18th century philosophical aesthetic idea um of um, delightful horror so the idea that you can get a kind of thrill from dangerous looking landscapes so the sea is a is a great example of this but a central condition of the sublime is that you view it from a place of safety so for instance Turner was the, the great artist who who kind of pioneered the sublime um, and he even painted um, after doing things like he apparently strapped himself to a mast of a ship in a storm and then came back and painted that experience. So it's really kind of getting as close to the danger as possibly could while being just about safe. And then painting that and, and bringing it to the audience. Um, and so this is a sort of meditation on the sublime. Um, but it is, yeah, it's slightly complicated by this figure here that is the sort of archetypal um, romantic wanderer who tends to be present in sublime pictures because you need somebody to be in these landscapes having a moment of sort of epiphany or whatever or meditation. But this figure is a black man and he's based on a, uh, um, a, uh, a slave um, figure who, um, called Elodu Equiano, and he um, wrote one of the first memoirs of what it was like to be a slave, and he bought his freedom um, around the time that the sublime aesthetic was at its peak. Um, so it just sort of complicates the idea of what the sublime means, um, because you cannot appreciate the, the sublime, you cannot experience delight in it, if you are unsafe, you have to witness it from a place of safety. Um, so I go, yeah, I explore that in more detail <laughs> in the chapter. It's quite, uh, yeah. You also point out, and because what so much of what we were talking about um, so far has been kind of metaphor and you write that it reminds us that the sea is not just a metaphorical store of memory, but reminds us that the sea is an unmarked grave for millions who lost their lives under the ages of slavery and empire. And you you mentioned that over the kind of clips over the 
video is a different excerpts from literary texts. So there's Wolves to the Lighthouse, there's Moby Dick, there's Heathcote Williams, Whale Nation, and there's also Derek Walcott's The Sea is History. I wanted to read this um, very haunting stanza. He says in The Sea is History, where are your monuments, your battles, martyrs? Where is your tribal memory? Sirs, it's in that great vault. The sea, the sea has locked them up. The sea is history. Yeah, I think that I think he says it. <laughs> he said he talks about us, the subtle and submarine history that is um hardly told. And I think uh yeah, this is a a kind of almost um an homage to that poem in a way, that idea that in fact the sea contains these lost memories and these lost voices. Um and it's thinking about who gets to tell those stories and why they were lost in the first place. And also thinking about how those things should not be repeated again. Um and he goes through what's interesting about this work is he goes through and picks up on patterns of of um basically human violence throughout the centuries um, and the acts of violence that have happened around the sea and they repeat and they repeat and they repeat and I think there's something to do with um, the sea being this vault, this place where things and secrets are locked away um, and buried and things we don't want to know about, things we don't want to see go there um, and it's a very powerful kind of uh, expression of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can read the ending of the book as a way yeah. to frame discussion. And since we started a bit late because of technological errors, we'll end with your permission a bit late. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is the final section of the book. Um, at the beginning of this book, I wrote about how I wanted to look from the sea back to the people standing watching the horizon from the shoreline. As each artist has stepped into view, so has their desire to say something, and so has their desire to find a way of saying it. I confess it has been harder not to be distracted too much by the messages contained within the artworks the nearer they were made to the present day. Although a conference approach to subject matter is oblique, reflective rather than polemical, I have found it difficult to step away from the meanings carried by his work. Writing now, it all feels too close, too scary to regard at the same cool distance as the others. I hope, however, that art continues to allow us to take a step back from the emergencies of the immediate moment. I hope that instead of only rendering a disaster at sea, future artists will still be compelled to create really fantastic renderings of the sea. For it is in the stretching of the imagination, the departure from the known, that helps others look again, notice more and see differently. Imagining these 10 artists standing side by side on the shoreline, I am reminded of a conference desire to set up conversations between unrelated things without listening in, without making any presumptions as to what might being said. The vision of the sea shown in Vertigo Sea, a troubled sea that bears the weight of past crimes and future strife, would have been impossible to imagine when Vanessa Bell took her children and her painting box down to Studland Beach one September day in 1910. It is irrelevant whether one is more important, more worth saying, than the other. Side by side, you only see that they are different expressions of the intensely human desire to say something and the desire to find a way to say it. In a hundred years' time, will we be able to look out to sea and allow it to take the mind on its own unique journey? Or will the sea be so entangled with urgent messages and meanings that the mystery of this voyage becomes a privilege of the past? Art offers a glimpse of where the eye takes the mind and how the sea spirits the imagination to faraway places. These journeys are made visible by art, but I hope they never become truly knowable because there is beauty in that distance, like the blue at the horizon that vanishes on approach. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Can we have a big round of applause, please? Thank you. So now if there are any audience questions. basically rattled you through the whole book so <laughs> yeah I mean you maybe you talk about it that this in the book but I was curious about how your vision of the sea how your experience of looking at the sea changed throughout 
working on this? Um, I think I became, um, it wasn't a sort of intended project that, uh, at the beginning, but basically I became very aware of how, how we've looked at the sea over time has changed. So that kind of emerged at its own, as its own thread that I then kind of kept on pulling, pulling through each through. artwork. So I suppose that became my kind of quest. Um, but I tried to keep myself sort of out of it. Um, and I think as well, your relationship to the sea changes each time you go to it, uh, who you're with, where you are. Um, so I kind of didn't want to introduce that too much into the book, but just try to imagine myself with the artist um, or looking back at them. Um, yeah, so the, the sea's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's, I sort of wanted it to be as changeable as possible. So I sort of didn't want to have one, my sea intrude upon other people's visions of it. Um, and also I tried to, I mean, all that, a lot of the artists that we know for making bits of the sea come from Cornwall or have spent time in Cornwall. But I did try to kind of find artists that had 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 um, spent time in different parts of Britain as well. Thank you, Lily. That was really captivating. I was just curious about how the project started. Um, did you begin with one of the works? Did you have a relationship with several of them and found that they had this common theme? Um, it feels like such a kind of beautifully coherent project. I'm sort of wondering what the seed was. Thank you. Um, this is probably the question I get almost asked most often, which is how, do I, how did I pick these 10 works? And it was, truthfully, it was sort of almost... Um, I set myself various parameters that meant that they sort of presented themselves in a way. So one of them was that each work had to be in a private, in a public collection, sorry, so that people could eventually see it in the flesh, possibly. Um, and also because I was interested in the implication that if it's in the national collection, somehow it's part of the national story. So it had a resonance at the time. The ideas were deemed important. So that I thought in itself was interesting. It wasn't just a person making something in isolation. In fact, it had a broader importance and resonance. Um, then I wanted to explore the different mediums that artists used um, over the last hundred years. Um, and then I wanted works that had a depth to them that had really engaged with um, history and um, yeah there was there was that sense that the work had to stand up to scrutiny in itself um, and then they were sort of roughly from uh, yeah a consecutive decade of the 20th century and they changed actually my first proposal I think five changed as, as I moved I wrote it chronologically so as I was moving through the century I sort of realized where I needed to go and perhaps what was missing or got interested in a particular idea and realized that an artist might be an opportunity to explore that um, in a better way for instance um, Barbara Hepworth was very closely in it um, but in the end she came from the same sort of circle as Wallace and and that kind of St Ives gang, and I wanted to introduce a new a new um, a new element there. Um, so they changed a bit, but actually um, it was sort of easier than you might sus suspect. <laughs> Picking them sort of unfolded quite naturally from each other, um, and once I decided, I just sort of went. And I suppose most good artworks if you start pulling at a thread of why they came into being, you really do come across very interesting things that connected to everything around it. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lily. Um, I was wondering if there was a clear idea for your next book that might have come out 
<laughs> while you were studying for this or since writing it? Um, short answer, no. <laughs> um, this felt very complete um, and it sort of satisfied a few questions that I'd been sort of thinking about over a long period of time. Um, so I haven't, I sort of need to regenerate a bit, I think, before the next one <laughs> comes. Um, but it would be lovely to take, make use of being in Paris um, somehow. Um, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I suppose one question to make the parameters even more tight and to borrow um, the phrase from Desert Island Disc, which maybe if there are any Brits in the audience, you would know if you had to pick one, save one piece from the waves, which one would you pick? Thank you. Um, it's a Radio 4 joke. Oh. <laughs> which I love, thank you. Um, it's, it's, I was thinking, this actually did cross my mind because when I do these talks, quite often I have to select the images to talk about. And it, it's always really hard to pick which ones um, because they're all very different and they all have their own um, sort of strengths um, and they take you in different paths um, of, of thought. Which one? Um, to live with. Hmm. On a desert island. Yeah, I don't think I'd want Vertigo Sea anywhere near me. Um, <laughs> there's a painting which isn't here uh, by Peter Lanyon um, called Offshore, which is my chapter five. Uh, which is a really fantastic painting that I think would keep giving and giving and giving. So that one, or maybe Stubland Beach. <laughs>